This morning is back to HCAM back to school season, and so I have invited the first two open mic participants today who are middle school students here from Hopkinton schools who uh, were wonderful participants in our recent local talent show as well. So without further ado, because that's going to try, I'm going to try to have that my mantra this season, not talk so much, uh, I would like to introduce our first performer today, and that's Sasha Yachenko. She's an eighth grader here in Hopkinton and a talented singer-songwriter. So uh, please help me welcome Sasha up here. All right, well, hello. I'm Sasha Yachenko, and um, I'm going to be singing a song called Etch a Sketch Heart for You. And I wrote this about, like, a couple months ago, so...
as, with my writer hat on. I wish I thought of etch a sketch heart. <laughs> <laughs> a wonderful song. Thank you for sharing it with us. And now, also from Hopkinton Public Schools, now in sixth grade, we have Andrew Matsoff, who will be performing the song Sunflower for us this morning. And we're happy to have Andrew. Please help welcome him. Now moving on to our guest features this morning. As I mentioned earlier, we have Victoria Bosch Murray and David Surrett, who have come from the South Shore of Massachusetts as our feature, ge feature guest poets this morning. David and Victoria not only are sharing the stage here today at HCAM, they share the stage at the Bridgewater Library at a monthly venue known as Poet Tribe, a wonderful place for the sharing of poetry. They also share the common path of being teachers. David at Bridgewater High School, where he teaches writing and English, and Victoria at Suffolk University. Fortunately, they have the day off today, and they can come and share with us. I'd like to begin with Victoria. Victoria Bosch Murray whose poetry has appeared in a number of poetry journals, has been writing as far back as she remembers. Her first self-published -pub book was written about her teddy bear in second grade, titled Teddy and Me. She was born into a bilingual family of nine who often moved around for her father's work. By the time she was 10 years old, she recalls having lived in California, North Dakota, Virginia, New York, and Spain and by, when she was 36, having married a man whose job likewise required travel, she had moved 22 times, and Victoria said, as a result, I've learned to adapt, first to fitting in, and then to standing out, and then to staying put. There's an art to everything. She went on to earn a number of degrees in literature, including her MFA in poetry, and teaching at Suffolk University now, in addition to her hosting work, and she is contributing editor to the Salamander Journal. And aside from all this, Victoria continues with her own writing and sharing of it in readings. And when asked about one of her most memorable moments reading, she stated, 
I was giving a reading at a coffee shop from my prayer poems, a series of short lyrics about ordinary moments. A woman was in the audience only because her daughter wanted to attend the reading. Afterwards, that woman came up to me as someone who didn't read poetry, and she said that the prayers had moved her. She had tears in her eyes, and that was two years ago. And now that same woman is writing her own poetry. Obviously a great source of inspiration with her words. We are happy and honored to have her sharing her poetry with us today. Please help me welcome Victoria Bosch Murray. Green. It hits her like a slap, a stone, stars stinging. It hits like a bounce check, addition, fees, a broken sofa spring, feathers escaping, a necessity. It hits her like hunger, a house with no furniture, the family car towed out of town, the family cat taken to the farm. She believed in the farm for years. Hits her like a stiff hug, a half kiss, a cold cheek, a hey, how are you, long lost on the street at the tea in a bar. Hits like the first beetle on the basil, the snow pea gone to seed, purple peppers, wine to vinegar, a lump in the breast, a second read on the x-ray. It hits her like a moving van in front of the house, everything on the lawn, a double mattress strapped to the back, two bikes, redwood lawn chairs wrapped in blue. Everything fits, hits like a flat tire, alone, 15 bucks to the freeway bandit to switch out the spare. Hits her like static, bad shocks, the needle on E, the next exit 57 miles. It hits like love and Elvis, like knowing all the words, like green, like gone, like leaving, like left. Um, as Cheryl said, I did move around a lot, so. <laughs> Ornithology. By heart, as if I had nothing else to do, I memorized names, kept them in a book with coded key, as though they could keep me. Nuthatch, purple finch, two tame hummingbirds beyond the kitchen window, the sink bursting, the linoleum yellow, that day you left. Birds at home on the cherry tree, a volunteer bouquet of goldfinch, purple sparrow, chickadee. I savored grackles, doves, that pair oblivious to me. It wasn't enough. I wanted more to make them come. I lured orioles from Baltimore, robins like baseball and spring, a buff, bluff of Queen Anne's lace. I saved rotten fruit. I crucified orange slices to the tree. I sacrificed black oil seeds before a tangled fist of sumac weeds. More, I wanted more. A bunting, a male, all that indigo blue. That day, one landed on a branch bare of blooms, and then, just as fast, nothing else would do. Okay, um, now I live in Situate, Mass, which is a little seacoast town, a uh, fishing village, really. Um, it's a beautiful place to live, and just recently, maybe in the past two years, it's entered my poetry, so I have a few about Situate. There's always a sailboat in somebody's yard, always a boat for sail beside the road, under a tarp blue as southern seas or exposed. More often than not, you stop and say, I always wanted to get away, go round the world, see the sights. You park two wheels on the grassy limit of lawn, you tap the hull on blocks, landlocked, paint peeled, teak tatty. You look thoughtful, and yes, the owners hope, natty, your stance as wide as water, rocking as you barter weather and leaf, wind against anything that might take us scudding down the road. Fishing. Three boys, three young boys jump off Situate Pier, a concrete dock where the tide drops the water 20 feet or 10 or 5. The boys hop a straight path across blacktop over chains, cables, winches, cleats, lines, thick as boy shins. There's a charter boat loading passengers below. We fight a wind as our hook flies toward blue, then back at us, the lure lost in asphalt and tanks, cars, trucks, diesel and decaying fish, a smear of new blood, scales like lost dimes, or boys. Who are these boys? I wonder if their mothers know, and what one would do if hers were not just here, but here and hurt, and she could not hear his cry, if he could cry, bruised, banged, submerged. 
If she'd know where to look, his body pulled toward missing anchors and debris where men pipe sledge and sand without grief to recast the shore. And we will bathe in water clean. We will dine on lobster and fish, something local and fresh. So I have uh, three daughters, and uh, the oldest lives away from home, and she came back to visit with her, her beau, her boyfriend. And this is called The Catch. I'm driving home in rain on the edge of a hurricane, Nate or Neil or Nick, not sure which, but I note how time has passed so fast they've gone this far in the alphabet, and how they used to name these tempests after women. I'm with my daughter and her beau in town for the day, we take the long way to show off the shore, the waves rolling gusts, sky mixed with water, a yeast rising, rising, rising. But there's a boat adrift, not a sloop, not a schooner, perhaps a catch, two-masted, main and mizzen, rigging fore and aft, except bare today, as though it had only just prepared to lie a hull, rocking like a buoy, precariously close to land where I know the shallow reeds lie. Beneath water, like silver, smelted thick and turbulent, she lists all 40 feet of her, at least. She's blue, my favorite color, and azure softened by water and wear. Oh, so lived in, and oh, she's sipping water at the gunnels. I'd save her if I could. I'd do anything to keep the untethered boat from slipping like a wounded heart into the chest of the sea. So uh, Cheryl mentioned the prayer poems, which are, uh, I have a series of about 50 poems, and they're all, um, they're prayers. They're like um, urges toward the transcendent, but very grounded in the real world. and. Um, I'm not going to read all 50, thank God, but um, um, they, they actually work as a, together as a poem writ large. On, they're all uh, 10 lines or shorter. They're very short poems. Um, prayer to writing about picking berries. Because they are sweet and bitter, fat, fleshy, and tongue tasty. Because there's water from a mountain spring because no one can see you from the road, a two-lane double yellow that twirls between hiking old rag and your house where no one is home. Because they remind you of the last time, two feet of snow still lingering, the first year you drove, arm out, window down, 70 degrees melting everything, parked, your legs on the dash, his hand at your grooved thigh, words humming, because you never knew until you did. Prayer to finding a parking spot. <laughs> circle once, twice, this might be your night. Buy a lotto, sneak a sip, circle yet again. Phone a friend, sing a song, be in no hurry, but when you see lights, shopping bags, keys in hands, pull aside a bit behind and savor your bliss. This is your space, this is your stranger kiss. Prayer, two blocks west of mine at beach. Rummaging for your door key, you hear the ocean, and it's a congregation again. Again, hallelujahs, amen, something gone right. You breathe the salt, satisfying like sex before dawn, rumbling waves responsorial, a holy of holies, a hovering mercy, a tapestry map back to azure and teas, a trail of incense, divine scarlet wine, the air so close you think it's going to kiss you, and you think about him, and it does. Prayer to lighting dinner candles. Sometimes from the gas flame of the kitchen stove. Sometimes from a click propane stick. Sometimes a wayward spark, a mistake. Sometimes because you want softness. Camped on the cliffs above the beach, the land so unsure it might slip while you sleep. Sometimes, sometimes. Or it might cleave for 25 more years. Prayer to pain. The doctor asks where it hurts. With the tip of a borrowed pen, you trace the absent rib. That biblical scar tickle the edge of the raised ridge, a vacant dune between land and sea, just below your left breast. Like asking where pleasure starts, where whiskey settles, when you first knew his hand in your heart.
prayer to riding shotgun. When he turns left into traffic, don't look right for a red truck, a yellow cab, a tanker in your lane. Don't say go, or now, or stay, <laughs> or clear. Just wait for the stomach spilling kick, and then, if you live, get used to it. <laughs> Prayer after burial. You're parked in a packed bar smoking pilfered cigarettes. The first two mooch from Mark Mugas, your little brother's friend. He's changed not a bit since second grade. Three more from a man wearing a Brett shirt. Good taste, at least, and good for another two. Six from a guy named Garnet. So far gone, he's not keeping count. These smokes are yours. You own them. You stash them. You burn them. Everything's ash. Prayer for Nani. No closet full of black and silk on sale. No undies. No dress ruffled down to there. No twirl and wedding cake karaoke. No illicit funeral kiss. No brandy Alexander this. No Christmas Eve of bustling bows. No sweet-lipped cousins. No snookered boyfriends. No swilled Chilean red. No lobster chowder. No foreign trips. No opals. No stolen rocks. No naked romp on the banks of a swirling Potomac. No more weeping in the ladies' room. No more sussing smudged mascara. No licked thumb. No used hanky. No sister, no friend. Prayer to falling. No one taught you to make pie from apples rotting on the counter, the crust unrolled from a box, a pinch of salt. No one taught you to smother weeds with mulch or to pack a tub with unwashed clothes and set the dial, a drum that squeaks with pain. No one taught you to fall asleep in the dark or to wake alone. Prayer, reading your horoscope. Your day will begin in morning and end in darkness. You'll be happy, then sad. Her hand will touch yours, then it won't. It will snow, rain, sun, and wind. You will be sad, then happy. Rain will melt the snow, sun will temper the wind. A seedling will root along the path to the woods. You'll hear light. A tree will fall before your door. The touch of her hand, no accident. Prayer to wearing perfume. For the first time in 10 years, as though warm roads and fried dough, as though campfire and boysenberries, sweat, summer rain, hot cotton, French toast, as though saline and seaweed, sulfur and cut grass bubble and soap. When sweet returns, than desire to. Carnations, avocados, jalapeno burn. Prayer to wreckage. The best thing about shipwrecks is the silence. Oh, not at first when there's screaming gale winds through the rigging, line becoming a bass, a whole damn string orchestra performing up is down, life flotsam as you roll and holler and splash and roar, but after. The dark, direct descent as certain as anything. Ships drop until they hit bottom, then stop. I have a, a few more. That's the end of the prayers for today. Um, I flew to Asheville last uh, January, and this is called screening at the Asheville Regional Airport. Long line for a Sunday afternoon, one agent says to another, and I overhear them, which is unusual for me. I'm partly deaf, a safe bet. I'll never betray your secrets. I probably didn't hear you confess. When I get to the head of the line, the agent says, everything has hidden meaning, like he's a fortune cookie or a wise man. And so I smile enigmatically. And then he says it again, this time enunciating carefully. Step to the side for additional screening. Is it because I'm a woman alone? I do my best to look innocuous, to feel nothing, to say less. It's what they want, I think. Behind me, one man says to another, are those salt and pepper shakers? No, they're my mother's ashes. 
I'm on my way out the gate. So uh, my brother lives in rural Virginia, and I saw this, I actually saw this next poem at his house. <clears throat> Breaking and entering. Above the rafters of the purple shed, a rat snake catches a Phoebe and slowly smothers her to death. I know it's a her because she's left two chicks in nest. They rustle like Sunday's paper as the snake takes her head into his mouth. Her wings stretch like ribs or Venetian blinds, set just so to let the light in. The wings fold round as a stone, small and smooth, almost gone. The feet dangle and disappear. Both chicks, too, just when I think he's done. So I also have, um, you know, I always say that poets write about two things, love and death, and of course you've heard some of the death, so. Um, this is a love poem. It's um, Abed is a um, you know lover's parting in the morning, and of course all poets want to write one, but they always always want to write a twist. So mine's a, mine's sort of a twist on that. <clears throat> Abed. It is raining. It is late. It is dark. The street light casts some light, but not enough. It is raining. It is dark. The damp says somewhere else. Oh, the late hours early. We stand, we talk like fiesta dancers on the piazza at night. Clear skies, late, early sangria, string guitars, a circle in the square, arms tangoed, and oh, the late hours that become early. The cat scratching the catalpa tree. The cat sleeping on the tire. The cat nudging his nose along the calf of my leg. Early sky like bluebirds, white sea glass green on a wet window, sun like mantilla on the sill, radiators casting at the night, a fat sigh, a slow ole. And um, I spent a lot of time in and around Boston, and um, it's, it's, I'm in love with the city. So this is called, it's another love poem. It's called, it's in the, um, the red line, in case you guys know it. It's like, um, near the Park Street Station, but this is uh, waiting for the right train. Actually, the next two are actually that whole intersection, the Park Street Station on the T. Waiting for the right train. The sun doesn't touch the tunnel. It never will. And so, wool buttoned, scarf pulled close, a girl alone with a guitar across the tracks sings Sinead and Stevie in a voice that spreads like whiskey, that first sip down the throat of noon or a kiss that numbs me. And rats run the rails, impervious to electricity, risk a human calculation. Players only love you when they're playing. Two lovers, he leans to her, coos into her, hear, her ear, his face at home in her hair. Nothing compares, and it's here too, underground, the doves have made a nest. And before I finish, I just want to thank Cheryl for running this uh, wonderful venue and for having me. Thank you, Cheryl. This is Traveling Mercies. Let the train be there. Let it be the right train. Let there be a seat. Let these things be unsaid. Movement is relative. A plane forms a contrail like a mower on a Saturday morning, like memory or time. A finch is a common bird. It will nest anywhere. Between morning sleep, no alarm, awake to sun on granite ledge, snails in the hedges alone, and the Boston of sweet buns, bums, and business suits, spicy sausage and onions, spring sun and sin on the common in June. There's no such thing as a trip to nowhere. If a clock is time, what is a map? How to know if it's you or the other person? Let sunset be graffiti and chain link. Let a triple decker be the color of birth. Let the price be mercy. A wrong turn can be meditation. A coin can be the whole fountain. Thank you. And we're moving on now to Victoria's Poet Tribe partner out there in Bridgewater at a wonderful poetry venue with David Surrett. David grew up on the North Shore of Malden, playing street hockey, but also writing. 
He began by making comic books and writing poems to Bobby Orr, the Marx Brothers, and some object of love. David claims that he wrote his first real poems when he attended a writing workshop in later life at the Boston Writing Project, where people were listening and seemed to enjoy his poetry, and he was motivated to keep writing then. He writes of childhood memories, family growing up in a blue-collar town, and adult relationships, noting his family is often the source of his inspiration. And he also often adds humor to his poetry, noting, I think humor draws the reader into the world of the poem. It's a welcome. And once they're in, I hope I treat them right and even offer a few surprises. David might be on his own at the farm at the crack of dawn, but we can go with him, taking us to places that he has been with his poetry today. So please help me welcome him, David Surrett. A beer with Barboza. I haven't talked to your mother in three years. I'm afraid to interrupt her. That's my father's favorite joke. <clears throat> my father's telling me the story about him and Uncle Eddie shaking hands with a killer. My mother reminds us she was born in South Boston among senators and mobsters. <clears throat> not dad, like it's not his story to tell. My mother is the storyteller, a Shanachie. I tell her a story and two hours later hear it retold way better, even though I'm no longer in it, but she is. <laughs> I bought her a tape recorder, showed her how to use it. She won't do it. Her stories live in her listeners. My father claims he's busy on his computer, informs me his life story will be hidden under his left shoulder in the casket. He and Uncle Eddie used to sell ads for the Herald Traveler. Bar to bar, no drinks until the last one. One night, two beers delivered at their first stop. They shook their heads no. The bartender nodded to a man in the corner. You tell him no. They knew who it was. The man approached, hunched over like he was wounded, their hands disappearing into his. He tried to kill my brother, says my mother. And of course he did. But my father's story needs an ending. Why had the killer chosen my father and his friend? Was he sizing them up? Did he see something in them missing in him? Jobs, mortgages, family? Did he envy their friendship? Mum's version will have the epiphany. Dad leaves it to me to figure out, and I'm trying. <clears throat> now, that's the first poem in my, in my new book. And I think it sets up sort of the tension and the dance between the lyrical and the narrative, the lyrical being my dad and my father being the narrative. Limbo. I fainted a lot when I was a kid, mostly in church and school. The votive candles would start to dance and I'd keel over. The wooden pews unforgiving. I wasn't the only one. A woman walking down the center aisle once collapsed like my father's folding ruler, the one I wasn't allowed to use. The Immaculate Conception Grammar School was too hot to keep egg salad in a lunchbox, ideal conditions for passing out. My favorite was in third grade when I blacked out and landed deep in Miss Downing's breast. A kind of heaven. I ended up in the purgatory, the pediatric ward. The kids acted like lifers. They asked me, what are you in for? I feigned coma. They planned escapes, tied bed sheets, and crashed model cars in all-night demolition derbies. They scattered at the squeak of nurses' shoes. The doctors glued electrodes to my head, but I never found out why. I knew a kid who was never told he was dying. first kiss in the last field, before houses crowded between and behind everything, before chain link, before my 11th birthday, before snakes and salamanders disappeared. It was Mr. Feely's backyard, a real yard, where he kept a car of curves, swollen as if it was inflated, nothing like my father's fin fury. We didn't trust him because he had a sign screwed to the front porch of his single-family home, attorney at law. 
Our fathers, milkmen, mechanics, firemen, policemen, pressmen, bus drivers, wearing their jobs and their names, stepped out of two family homes and kissed our perfumed, beehived, beautiful mothers goodbye. His wife was tissue paper, wrinkled, dry dust. I ran into Feely Jad and kissed her. A burst of static electricity so frightening it would be years before I would dare again. And never with her. She moved away, money enough for fields of her own. Before I learned to lie, my father opened my bedroom door and flipped on the light, waking my Western-themed wallpaper, saddles, guns, and spurs. <clears throat> There's been a terrible accident. A boy and girl from my junior high killed by a speeding commuter train. He flipped off the light, a mercy at the sound of her name. He knew I loved her. Later, he returned to tell me the report was wrong. It was my cousin dead alongside of that boy. He let the light shine on my face. Don't be so happy. But I knew it was better that those boys died. Boys who flipped the hair out of their eyes when they lit their cigarettes, who swore at me for the crime of being younger, whose last life gesture was given the finger to the oncoming train, not knowing that two trains traveling towards each other on parallel tracks make the same sound. Virgins. Jim and I visited the dying girl, my first time in a girl's bedroom. She sat on the edge of her bed, a scarf on her head, talking to us like boys in her room were no big deal. Jim knew her from before and talked easily. She was part of the mystery that kept me up at night since seventh grade, but here I was in her bedroom, talking to, talking to her with all the self-righteousness and advantage of a boy doing the right thing. I ran out of stuff to say and spent a lot of time staring at the Savoy Brown record, leaning at the front of a stack of albums I wanted to touch. It bothered me not knowing what they sounded like. I was the guy who bought Jethro Tell albums in Harvard Square as imports. We never talked about why we were there. We stayed until we felt good about ourselves. I never went back. I never owned a Savoy Brown LP. She made it to graduation. Um, I was raised in Malden. I lived there for 37 years. I'm the opposite of Vicky. I've lived in two homes. And, uh, and I was raised in Malden uh, in two religions. <clears throat> One, I was raised a Catholic um, and a hockey player. <laughs> How the worn jersey of time unravels, Thomas O'Grady. My brother lies on a gurney in the catacombs of the Boston Arena, a lightning bolt gash across his right eye. A medical student with an accent stands over him, an open medical book, How to Suture. He tugs the needle and thread through Steve's skin, no anesthesia, no complaints except hurry up doc, I'm not missing the whole period. A Somerville High School fan unhappy at the five goals I scored against them last time calls the rink to tell my coach my parents are dead. A car accident on the way to the game, because who would play then? It was a lie, exposed by the sight of my parents already in their seats, my dad watching warm-ups, checking the goalie's weaknesses, my mother wishing we played a gentler game. I drag my son from his bed at 6 a.m., knowing I can have him in his gear before he's awake enough to protest. Believing when he slides that puck under the prone goalie, it'll be enough. A promise life can't take back. He quit when he got the chance. Um, I'd like to finish this section of Malden poems with this poem. Uh, Someone mentioned that once that a lot of my poems take place in bar rooms, and if you've been to Malden, some of the Leverett Revere, there are a lot of bar rooms. But this is a part, an important lesson about when you go to a bar room. It's called Ancient Order. First stop before the subway to the game, tagging along with my brother and his friends. Their older brothers, wearing their jobs, fill the bar stools. Chrissy says, 
I'd write the story of this place if I could only spell. Says he's working on his PhD. He never went to college, but he's read Dubliners. No women, except for the aerobic instructor on TV. There's a life-size mural on the wall. Chrissy says someone he forgets who painted it about 10 years ago. The men in the mural are the men at the bar. Same seats, same pose, same clothes. A sobering reflection. They stay, we go. So at 37, I moved out of, out of the city, out of Malden. Um, and I don't have chickens. That's one of my rules. I keep telling my wife, no chickens. I have horses and sheep uh, and dogs. And, well, actually, dog now. Um, so I'd like to read a couple of my, my animal poems. Um, this, is my, this is called Beautiful Horse. And in the last 12 years or so, we've had a lot of horses. And some work out and some don't work out. And this is an early horse uh, that didn't work out, that I wish I, had, I still had. It's called Beautiful Horse. Andy was a roan snowflake Appaloosa, 14 and a half hands, small, but rode like my brother-in-law's Corvette, the thrill of engine between legs, the turning of heads. He was a bolter, no warning walk to gallop in seconds. We learned this on our first ride at home, which ended with Kathy out of sight, off her saddle. I got there late, and I hit him hard. It didn't cure him. We sent Andy to a trainer. He was a bolter, too, packed his horses, my horse, too, and escaped his creditors to Florida. I learned the necessary lessons. The horse knows why it runs. The horse remembers arrows in its hide, cot and carriage, plow and harness, mine shaft and battlefield, and the hard hands of man, their hobbles, whips, spurs, and wire bits. Good riddance to the man who stole my horse. But come back, Andy, to these wiser hands, and learn to trust to run to me. Um, my new book is uh, called Easy to Keep, Hard to Keep In, which is the name of the next poem. Um, this is my ram, Glenn. And I was at a sheep festival, which is, which is funny for me anyway. It's probably funny for anybody. And I overheard a man say that about sheep. You know, sheep, easy to keep, hard to keep in. And it's true. You, could, you just give them grass or hay and they're happy, except they spend the whole day trying to escape. Um, like men. <laughs> There, there are a lot of sheep words in the poem, which I'm not going to explain because I didn't know them before I had sheep. So this is easy to keep, hard to keep in. He came to us a bummer, bottle-fed and diapered. When I went to CVS for Depends, I feared the intercom price check. <laughs> he sat on us, he sat on our couch with us, rammed our open hands for a plaid, chewed everything paper the Boston Globe, horse and rider, tale of two cities. The vet banded him so our bummer became a weather. Outside he went with his new family, a white weather raised by a ewe mother and a ram, too big to castrate. The bummer is easy to catch, hard to hold. The weather, hard to catch but caught, lies in submission waiting for the quick death. I grabbed the ram by his horns and there's no escape. My wife sits and spins cards and knits, and I do my version of it. We have names for what we make, like the naming of our sheep, which I hope they know means the worst thing that will ever happen to them is the annual sharing to provide socks for everyone who asks. Um, and when you, when you live where I live now, in the swamp, uh, you have a lot of... Uh, animals to come visit you. And growing up in the city and, and on a subway and going into town all the time, I was never afraid. And looking back, I should have been afraid a lot. Um, but living in the swamp, I'm afraid all the time. Uh, and I also have a terrible fear of horror movies or horror TV shows. So this is after watching The X-Files. After watching The X-Files, I hate to feed the horses their night hay. 
I'm the lone man sacrificed in the first scene. The lineman climbing the pole, the mail carrier slipping the letters in the slot. I push the stubborn shed doors and a madman crouches behind the tractor. I listen for him, matching his breath and step to mine. His hand reaches for my neck. He waits in the camouflage of the stable stompings and snorts, ready to cut a smile across my throat. The swamp's night noises taunt me. I grew up with less scary sounds. Sirens, police, fire and ambulance. Drunk, stumbling home, singing. Romeo's calling at windows. Father's answering. A bagpipe from the Beaton's house. Here it's peepers, bullfrogs, and owls. Chores done, I bolt for the house, breathless, exhilarated from the many little deaths. Hoping for one more. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this is another animal that came to visit. Uh, in the backyard, I smell death. No wonder we fear it. It took a mowing to uncover a young fox on its side, fully furred, empty eyes, legs extended like it died, dream running. I fetched a shovel from the shed, pried it off the grass. Under the bugs had eaten him to the bones, his skeleton marvelous. He left a shadow on the grass like the cloth of Veronica. It's still there, a profile of a fox running from death, or maybe towards it. I do want to thank Cheryl. This is a, a wonderful place. Um, she's been a wonderful host, and I thank you for coming. Um, it's funny that when Cheryl talks about humor, having two books out now, uh, the first book, and now, now people can compare the two, and a lot of people have said that the second book isn't as funny as the first book. It's actually kind of sad. Um, but I had three terrible years, to tell you the truth. And even my memory poems were through that prism of, of sadness. So even a memory like the hospital memory, um, uh, a sad memory was attached to it. But good news for me is that the poems I've been writing have been resurrection poems, like over and over again. Um, and this is the last poem I wrote for this book, which was a hint of it. And if I, I wouldn't want to compete with Vicky's prayers, but it's a kind of a prayer if I may end with it. Um, and it's called Intercession. So, um, My brother gave me a St. Anthony medal, blessed by Father Nicholas. A man holy like a bird is holy, or like a bird is simply itself. I fear sleep more than anything. I woke the next morning with the medal warm on my chest as if I had dozed in the sun. It is no bigger than a fingerprint. Thank you. And we're ready to move on with Sarah Barillo. Sarah is not a teacher, but she also attends school. She's presently in her senior year of high school, and she's been performing her songs for three years. She's getting a lot of attention in so short a performance time. Her music is classified anywhere between folk blues and rock. She has one full-length album, and she's working on her second one to be finished by the end of this year. And uh, you can talk to Sarah about her website uh, and information to find out how you could get a copy of that, or either one. She's having her music featured in a film coming out in 2009 entitled The Prince of Providence, about former Mayor Cianci of Providence, and I think starring Robin Williams and others. Growing up, her favorite pastime was playing piano. And then she began playing guitar. And in high school, she started performing at community talent showcases and has gone on to music venues like coffee houses and concert settings. And the past two years has been winning the songwriting contests, including the Boston Folk Festival Songwriting Contest, the John Lennon Bus, and the Taza Cafe Songwriting Contest. Already, she's reaping the rewards not only of songwriting contests, but a growing base of fans for her songs that she writes and how she sings them. And when Sarah was asked to share a memorable moment performing her music, she responded, I think any time I can get a loud room to be silent is a memorable moment. And I've seen her accomplish that. And we are so glad that you could come and share your music with us this morning. Please help me welcome Sarah Varello. Hi. 
I'm Sarah Barello. Um, I actually came down with a cold last night, just for today. And uh, so we'll see what happens with that. Hopefully it's not too painful to hear. I'm just going to do a couple of songs that I wrote. This one's called Exit, and I have no idea what it's about. <laughs>
I can make it through a couple more. <laughs> I uh, was at work last night, and I started to sneeze a lot. And I was like, no. I've had this gig planned out for so long, and it's going to be on television. And then God gave me a cold. And that was cool. And I was up last night, like, coughing and sneezing. And I was like, ugh. Perfect timing. Absolutely perfect. But that's the way things work sometimes, I guess. Uh, this next song is called Live on a Line. And, um, yeah, I don't really have much to say about any of these. <laughs>
Thank you. <coughs> I'm currently recording, or in the process of recording, so I don't have any CDs with me because I don't want to pass out something that doesn't sound the way I want it to sound, which is pretty much everything that I have right now because it's all like live performances or just me up in my room with a little recorder and it just doesn't sound good, so. If you like what you hear at all, um, I have a MySpace and it's just, uh, it's just myspace.com slash Sarah Borello and if you spell my name wrong, you'll probably get Sarah Borellis because she stole my name and she's famous, so. Uh, um, not bitter at all. I have to change my name though. So if you guys are you know, arts are artistic and you have good ideas, so uh, maybe stage names. If you think of anything cool, please let me know because I can't think of anything. Uh, uh, this is a song called Unhinged, and I I, I guess I probably seem a little bit nuts, and it's because I am. But this song will probably take the cake. <laughs> hard to hold the risks of optimism slay me oh I'm rising up above the fumes with a body shiver and we start to bloom and all in all it always gets me oh your mama don't like a girl like me stay away son she's a little Take direction, it'll be just fine when I lose connection to every person in this room. No, I won't love you, I won't say it back, I won't force you to do a stupid thing like that. Hilarity is so depressing. Yeah, your mama don't like a girl like me. Stay away, son. She's a little unhinged Just a little bit Whoa, daddy say Why can't you see She's a little I'm a little unhinged Just a little bit I'm so gorgeous I'm so overwhelmed I love my body And I love myself and I will never be sarcastic Oh, let's drive to the edge of the night Where adrenaline flows gets me feeling alright I wanna be the loosest cannon Hey, your mama don't like a girl like me Stay away, son, she's a little unhinged Just a little bit What I'm told to great against joy when it's hard to hold The risks of optimism slay me Ooh, you're cool, but I'm cooler than you I'm more than what you thought and what you're thinking too This liberation is refreshing She 
is a little, I'm a little unhinged. Yes, I little bit. Yes, I little bit. Yes, I little bit. Yes, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Um, do I have time for one more? Or is that it? One more. All right. Okay, that's good. I can show you that I'm not always serious and strange. Well, actually, I'm always strange. <laughs> uh, this is a song about gold diggers, and I was watching, uh, I don't know, it was like a TV special, and like my, like, I don't, I don't remember what it was that made me think of it, but it was like, yeah, Sugar Daddies, it was a show about Sugar Daddies, and, and I was like, oh my god, this is awesome, I should write a song from the perspective of a gold digger, because they're awesome, they're just powerful women, and... So I did. <laughs> and this is it. Hey, I'm a woman. Live for the green.
just finished the bridge a couple days ago sometimes that happens with songs you you get them mostly written and they won't finish themselves then sometime later it happens uh, I won't wreck it anymore by telling you any more about it it's called Liberty Girl Liberty girl, I've been misusing you Most times when you reveal I want nothing to do When you speak, my attention fades Lips remain numb, little to say. Liberty, babe, been lost in the gray. Gotta be something or someone. Shake me awake Heard you running through the yard just today I shut the blinds Hid inside She said, Bay, what made you lose interest in something you once held so dear? Did you settle for life, lived on safer ground, away from tears? Did reason leave your passion somewhere far behind? Seems time is truly the one thing that changes most minds. Liberty, babe, you're ahead in the haze. You could start counting on me. Today is the day. It won't be long now, babe. Just watch what I do Listen to what I say Just watch what I do Listen to the words I say Watch the deeds Listen to the words I wrote the song for my friend Kylie. She was having a rough week, and I did this to cheer her up. Cheer her up. <laughs> um, not very creatively, I've titled it The Kylie Song. I hope you like it. Cuckoo, Kylie. 
Kai Kai My girl, don't cry It breaks my heart to know you're alone When all you want to do is go on home You're up in Maine with just yourself to bear the pain I wanna hold you but you're so far away It takes a lot just to get through the day Cuckoo Kai Kai My girl don't cry It breaks my heart to know you're alone When all you wanna do is go on home The bravest girl I've ever known I'm awed by the courage that you've shown Seven days is just a moment in the life of this girl And I know sometimes it's just you against the world Cuckoo, Kai Kai, my girl, don't cry it breaks my heart to know you're alone When all you want to do is go on home Wake up from this nightmare cause you know I'll be waiting for you out there You don't have to cry tonight Just hang in there for a while And until then I'll just wait to see you smile Cuckoo, Kai Kai My girl, don't cry It breaks my heart to know you're alone When all you wanna do is go on home <laughs>A young girl once drowned her nameless infant in a forest pool, her upturned face catching the moon's indifference, her disconnected hands struggling deeper and deeper still, her mouth murmuring, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. Thank you. This is called uh, Emma's Lullaby. think this world is free from unpleasant pain That the walls around your home are inviolable If your pleasant little town feels untouchable And the long and happy life seems inevitable All your passwords and encryptions all the locks upon your door I like cotton candy armor Or a fortress made of smoke You're not a baby, Emma And safety's really just a joke When your mother leaves the room And you're alone there Something evil might be coming the back stair could be a virus could be a blood clot if you run out of the house 
cross into the dark street You might trip or step on something in your bare feet Could be a stingray, could be a landmine Who knows what could be inside your closet Who knows what's under the bed Some slow or sudden autoerotic mishap Someday, somehow, you'll end up dead Someday, somehow, you'll end up dead Someday, somehow, you'll end up If you think this world is free from unpleasant pain That the walls around your house are inviolable if your pleasant little town feels untouchable And the long and happy life seems inevitable All your passwords and encryptions All the locks upon your door Are like cotton candy armor Or a fortress made of smoke you're not a baby, Emma, and safety's really just a joke. If when your mother leaves the room and you're alone there, something evil could be coming up the back stair. Could be a virus, could be a blood clot. If you run out of the house into the dark street, trip or step on something in your bare feet could be a landmine could be a stingray who knows what could be inside your closet who knows what's under the bed gruesome slow or sudden autoerotic mishap someday somehow you'll end up dead Someday, somehow, you'll end up dead. Someday, somehow, you'll... If you were born between the years of 1948 and 1955 or six, you had this experience in school. You youngsters, you just have to imagine what it was like. <laughs> There are eight wads of gum stuck to the bottom of my desk. How do you know, you ask? Well, I can count them. After all, what else can you do while waiting for the siren to stop sounding and the all-clear bell to ring? Let's have quiet, she says, as she strolls among the aisles. And I wonder why the teacher pays no heed. If she does not crawl under the safety of her desk when the bombs fall, she will be burnt to a crisp. Isn't it awful? <laughs> I'm a teacher too, and yet it's such a satisfying image. <laughs> Even though the wads of gum have got my full attention, I am watching from the corner of my eye for the slightest glint of silver to come streaking across the sky so I can say a little prayer before we die. And then suddenly the siren stops its howling and we hold our breath and then begin to squirm till a higher power rings the recess bell to set us free to return to reading about Dick and Jane who get to chase a ball around with Spot the cutest little dog and they run and they jump and they skip and the sky is always blue and the grass
grass is always green But I'll never ever look up in the sky And laugh like Dick and Jane I will always watch for that glint of silver To come whistling the announcement of the end Of all life that we have known That's funny. <laughs> Thank you. I had a lot of fun this morning. I'm inspired and I'm a little bit paranoid. <laughs> it was a wonderful uh, welcome back to HCAM and Wake Up Smell the Poetry. And I'd like to say thank you once again to our wonderful morning features of uh, Victoria Bosch Murray and David Surrett. and singer-songwriter Sarah Borello as well. And to all of you who've come and shared something today as well as come listen, thank you for making this community what it is. And come back next month, October 18th, with John Hodgen and Gertrude Halstead, who I believe will be carpooling from Worcester, and sharing their poetry, and John Swenson sharing his song, songs and words um, from Pennsylvania. Uh, hope to see you next month. Thank you again. Oh!